about every 15 to 20 years, we have another crisis. We call them panics. We had different names for them. For 140 years, the pattern is just unmistakable. Then we hit the Great Depression. And coming out of the Great Depression, we put three new regulations in place. Glass-Steagall, which divides our community banks from the Wall Street investment banks, FDIC insurance, and some SEC regulations so you can invest on Wall Street and they can't cheat you too directly. For 50 years, we have no bank failures, no major crises. It works. Additional regulations were added in 1939 and 1940, and again in 1956. Controls remained in effect until the first erosion of the Glass-Steagall Act during the 1980s. It gets to be the early 1980s. We go with this idea of let's get rid of regulation of what happens. Late 1980s, savings and loan crisis, should have been a warning. Late 1990s, remember long-term capital management, nope. the hedge fund, should have been a warning. Early 2000s, Enron, should have been a warning, but we let it go. And where do we end up? In the biggest crisis since this Great Depression. I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, was such as that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders. And we are deliberately and certainly with this legislation moving towards inheriting much greater risk in our financial services industries. We will in 10 years time look back and say we should not have done that because we forgot the lessons of the past. 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 When it comes to bailouts of American business, Barney Frank and the Congress may be just getting started. Nearly two trillion tax dollars have been shoveled into the hole that Wall Street dug, and people wonder, where's the bottom? It turns out the abyss is deeper than most people think, because there is a second mortgage shock heading for the economy. In the executive suites of Wall Street and Washington, you're beginning to hear alarm about a new wave of mortgages with strange names that are about to become all too familiar. If you thought subprimes were insanely reckless, wait till you hear what's coming. What's the future hold? Well, this shows... One of the best guides to the danger ahead is Whitney Tilson. He's an investment fund manager who's made such a name for himself recently that these investors, who manage about $10 billion, gathered to hear him last week. Tilson saw a year ago that subprime mortgages were just the start. We had the greatest asset bubble in history, and now that bubble is bursting. The single biggest piece of the bubble is the U.S. mortgage market, and we're probably about halfway through the unwinding and bursting of that bubble. Halfway. It may seem like all the carnage out there, we must be almost finished, but there's still a lot of pain to come. Um, in terms of write-downs and losses that have yet to be recognized. In 2007, Tilson teamed up with Amherst Securities, an investment firm that specializes in mortgages. Amherst had done some financial detective work, analyzing the millions of mortgages that were bundled into those mortgage-backed securities that Wall Street was peddling. And they were frankly terrifying as data we'd never seen before. And that's what made us realize, holy cow, things are going to be much worse than anyone anticipates. After remaining at a steady growth of 4% for decades, home prices exploded at the end of the 1990s. Over the next half decade, the housing bubble inflated as the price of homes tripled. Contributing factors included house flipping, equity withdrawal, and the feeding mortgage-backed hedge funds with subprime mortgages. Building a mortgage-backed security is like making a Dagwood sandwich. We start with a slice of equity and a small percentage of lower-grade assets. 
The bulk of the security is filled with high-grade assets, prime mortgages. However, in order to meet investor demand, the composition of real estate-backed securities changed. The newer version of these securities soon were filled with low-grade assets, subprime mortgages. They were also filled with a small portion of mid-grade assets and a thin slice of prime on top. The resulting collateralized debt obligation does not look attractive to investors. However, finding a bond rating agency that was willing to wear rose-colored glasses The securities were rated as top grade, which made them highly marketable. We're talking about betting against the very thing that you're selling without disclosing that to that client. Is there not a conflict? In the context of market making, that is not a conflict. The trouble now is that the insanity didn't end with the subprimes. There were two other kinds of exotic mortgages that became popular, called Alt A's and Option Arms. The Option Arms, in particular, lured borrowers in with ultra-low initial interest rates, called teaser rates, sometimes as low as 1%. But after two, three, or five years, those rates reset. They went up, and so did the monthly payment. Now the Alt A and Option Arm loans made back in the heyday are starting to reset causing the mortgage payments to go up and homeowners to default. The defaults right now are, are incredibly high at unprecedented levels and there's no evidence that the default rate is tapering off. Those defaults almost inevitably are leading to foreclosures and homes being auctioned and home prices continuing to fall. What you seem to be saying is that there is a very predictable time bomb effect here. Exactly. I mean, you can look back at what was written in 05 and 07, you can look at the reset dates, you can look at the current default rates, and it's really very clear and predictable what's going to happen here. Just look at this projection from the Investment Bank of Credit Suisse. These are the billions of dollars in subprime mortgages that reset last year and this year. Now look at what hasn't hit yet the Alt-A and Option Arm resets when homeowners will pay higher interest rates in the next three years. We're at the beginning of a second wave. Another contributing factor to the housing crisis has been long-term unemployment. Jobs lost are not easily recovered. Forecasts imply that it takes four times as long to regain jobs as to lose them. As home prices drop, the number of underwater mortgages increase. Three-fourths of ARM mortgages have gone underwater. The greatest amount of ARM mortgage loans were written in 2005 and 2006. Foreclosures on the most abundant types of mortgages may increase by as much as five-fold. How big is the potential damage from the old A's compared to what we just saw in the subprimes? Well, the subprime was approaching a trillion. The alt A is about a trillion. Um, and then you have option arms on top of that. Uh, that's probably another five to six hundred billion on top of that. How many of these option arms would you imagine are going to fail? Well north of 50 percent. My gut would be 70 percent of these option arms will default. How do you know that? We know it based on current default rates, and this is before the reset. So people are defaulting even on the, the little 3% teaser interest-only rates they're being asked to pay today. They stop checking whether the income was even real. They turn to low and no-doc loans, so-called liar's loans, uh, and jokingly referred to as ninja loans. No income, no job, no assets, and they were still willing to lend. But help me out here. How does that make sense right. for the lender? It yeah. would seem to be reckless in the extreme. It was, but the key assumption underlying the willingness to do this was that home prices would keep going up forever. And in fact, home prices nationwide had never declined since the Great Depression. And there are tough years to come. 
because just like the subprimes, the Alt-A and Option R mortgages were bundled into Wall Street securities and sold to investors. This next wave of defaults, which everyone agrees is inevitably going to happen, how central is that to what happens to the rest of the economy? It's core. It's core because housing is such an important part of the supply of housing units on the market. And that's grown from 2.2 million units about three years ago up to 4.5 million uh, units earlier this year. Well, with the housing supply increasing that much, what does it mean? It means that this problem, the economic difficulties, are not going to be resolved in a short period of time. It's not going to take six months. It's not going to take 12 months. We're looking at probably about three, four, or five years before this overhang, the supply overhang, is worked through. The same craziness that occurred in the mortgage market occurred in the commercial real estate markets. And that's taking a little longer to, to show, but, but there are going to be big losses there. A second mortgage tsunami may result in a home price decline of an additional 70%. Could you give me a yes or no to whether or not you considered yourself to have a duty to act in the best interests of your clients? 